Hey folks, this is Patriot Nurse. Join me today for a coronavirus update. I apologize for this little thingy right here, but I wanted to make sure that y'all get a decent audio uh, experience today. So I'm sure I'm gonna get criticized a lot for this, um, for, for kind of changing my assessment on things and for being late to the game or whatever the case may be, but here's the thing. All right, I have a responsibility to not only my subscribers, but also my profession as a nurse. And I don't want to be one of those people that unnecessarily stoke the fires of panic, right? Um, because that doesn't help. That doesn't help anything. So what I do want to go over with you guys is the new data. And also I want to go over some of the clinical checklists for healthcare providers and the information furnished by the CDC. And to to parse through this information with a historical lens, right? And an understanding of how people act during pandemics. So the data that I've been looking at here, I have to keep myself straight. Like <laughs> I've got all my little, my little notes here. The data that I've been looking at for the projected caseload over the next week, I expect um, if this data is correct and if the graph is correct, I expect there to be approximately 100,000 cases worldwide by the end of this weekend. Um, now, a note here about this. The vast majority of people who are experiencing this coronavirus have nondescript cold flu-like symptoms. The latest data that I've got here of the, the, the aggregate that was assessed in this, the CDC data here, 83 to 98% of patients had a fever, 76 to 82% of them had a cough, and 11 to 44% had general achiness and fatigue. You only start seeing the severe downturn in populations that don't seem to kick it in really the first week. Um, essentially, what the CDC found was that of the people who had, there was a population they studied, it was 425 patients who were sick enough basically to go to a physician, healthcare provider, be diagnosed, and a lot of them were hospitalized. Of those people, of those 425 people, one third to one half of them had pre existing underlying conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, and cardiovascular disease. Now, all three of those that were mentioned by the CDC, all three of those are chronic inflammatory conditions. Inflammatory, whether it's type one or type two, diabetes is an inflammatory response of the body. Whether it's an inflammatory self-destructive mode in type one of the beta cells of the pancreas, or we have inflammation in the body in general and you know screwed up distribution of insulin through the pancreas. Bottom line, inflammation and chronic inflammation seems to be a, a more, strong corollary, a stronger corollary for whether or not a person will be able to kick this or it, you know, progresses into a much more dangerous form of the disease. The people that have the hardest time with this from the clinical data that I'm seeing, again, are over 50. That's not to say that there aren't patient outliers who have severe problems. You don't, I think there's a gentleman who passed away in the Philippines who was 44. Um, that's not to say that there aren't mortality it's, you know, there, that there isn't mortality in patients who don't fall into that age category, but they're much more likely to have a harder time with it if they are older, if they have pre-existing inflammatory conditions. Do I expect that the mortality rate in China is going to be transportable to the United States? No, I do not for many reasons. The first is I've watched some of these videos, okay, the, you know, these leaked videos from whistleblowers and you have to be very careful, okay, when you're watching these videos, especially when you're getting links, because oftentimes people will be watching them with a preconceived notion, like, like the conclusion has already been made for them, and then they're backtracking and watching the video, verifying the point that was already made. So you have to be careful and watch these things if you're gonna watch them objectively with an open mind. So I'm watching this one particular video you know, that shows body bags being loaded into the ambulance and, um, and you know, where this person is basically walking through the hospital in China. And my first thought was, there's no control here over these zones. Like you have a zone inside that's hot where you have people who are actively infectious. And then you see in the video, these non-infected persons, I suppose, who are patients, family members, whoever, just walking in between these zones. And then you have the door where the whistleblower is walking in and out 
there's no control over these areas you know, that's being implemented. There's no checkpoints. There's no stopping and checking in between. That's a severe problem, okay? <laughs> like, it doesn't surprise me. I'm not happy about this. I'm not laughing because I'm happy about people. I'm just incredulous at how stupid and ineffectual that this control is in the hospital when there should be much more stark delineation between zones. And that's not happening, at least from this particular video that I saw. Um, they don't seem to be effective at their management of, you know, the containment and cording off of different zones that a person should be doing and a hospital and an institution should be doing. In the United States, praise God, our nurses are the best trained nurses in the world, period. Absolutely best trained nurses in the world. Um, we are, especially with the baccalaureate uh, programs, at least, you know, many a moon ago when I was in there, they're very, very demanding benchmarks you know that had to be met early on in the program at least in the program that i graduated from so we have a much better infrastructure capable of taking care of this you know when it comes here and i do expect it to you know to increase i do expect it like i said for there to be probably six figures worth of cases worldwide by the end of this weekend i do expect that the caseload is going to continue to rise probably for the next between four to six weeks and at that point yeah, it's time for a reevaluation, um, but it it has spread, and I know that some people, of course, are going to be critical of my you know my timeline and not breaking this earlier. But you have to understand, right? Um, I have a responsibility to you as a nurse. I don't want to. I don't want to just okay stoke fires of flame here, panic, buy this, buy this, buy that. Listen, like if you think that you're going to buy a mask and that's going to help. It, it, no, at this point, masks are one part of the equation, okay? But this is an entire spectrum of general preparedness, okay? Like you can wear a mask all day long, but if you don't wash your hands after you go to the bathroom, you're wasting your money. Why don't you give the mask to somebody else who's actually going to practice good health care <laughs> and it, it had good health promontory practices? This is, this is a spectrum, okay? The masks in public and in public places, okay, not a bad idea because we want to try and limit droplets. At this point, it does seem you know, to be that you can when you inhale somebody's spit who has the coronavirus or who is shedding the virus. Yeah, that's one method for disease transmission, but there is an obvious fecal oral co component to this too. You know, people just not washing their hands or definitely washing their hands when they leave the bathroom, washing their hands before they prepare food. Um, another thing to consider as well, this, the practice in many areas and cultures is family family style dining where you have one pot and everybody reaches their hands in. That needs to stop right now, right now. When you are serving food, it needs to be individually dolloped onto people's plates from the central location by an individual who has been very, very diligent to wash their hands. If you don't have a high temperature dishwasher, okay, um, there, I need to try and find this for you. I used to know this many moons ago, but basically there should be uh, bleach incorporated into the washing of your dishes, okay? When you're looking at getting together with people, I would really try and avoid at this point the handshaking and all that other stuff. Churches, y'all, <laughs> on Sunday morning, everybody stands up, shake your neighbor's hand around. How about do this? <laughs> I love you. In the Lord, I love you. I love you. Virtual hug. Yeah, that would be a good thing. Um, but just we need to practice containment and good health care practices at this point, the washing of the hands. Um, when you get home, take your shoes off. When you get home, drop your purse and your keys at the door. If you work as a bus driver or you work in a place uh, where there's lots of human beings back and forth like airports, um, bus stations, train stations, terminals like that. Also, if you work in an area very close to it, like for instance, you're an employee at a cafe really close to where people get off from there, you need to be very, very vigilant about this, especially when you come home, okay? And of course, also at your place of work, practicing good hand washing and sanitation as well. When it comes to the coronavirus and how it's manifesting, again, the vast majority of people who are contracting this are showing up with nondescript flu or cold-like symptoms, you know, with a fever and with a cough. Let me talk about fever for a minute. I tend to align much more with the vitalist mentality versus the atomist mentality when it comes to dealing with fevers. I do not believe that fevers are inherently a bad thing. They are inherently a good thing to a patient who is stable otherwise. 
fevers from the atomist mentality, and the atomist is more of like you're very, very clinically oriented. We believe that the body is, whenever it's sick and in a state of malfunction, you know, they tend to want to suppress fevers at any given point. I do not subscribe to that. I believe that because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, if your patient is otherwise stable and has no other contraindications, like for instance, seizure activity or history of, you know, um, uh, life-threatening issues resulting from fever. If your patient is otherwise healthy, the fever should be supported and managed, not suppressed. And how do we support and manage fever? Hydration. Hydration. Get them to sweat. Hydration and sweating. Dr. Christopher talks about this. I'll try and find a link for you guys. I'm doing most of my interaction on Patreon for people um, at this point just so that I can you know, limit you know, the amount of work that I'm having to do in the midst of everything else. But fevers should be supported, not suppressed. When the body is spiking a fever, it is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It's telling you, A, this person's probably contagious. B, it's saying, okay, I've got to ratchet up the thermostat here because I need to get circulation moving and all my inflammatory products need to get distributed here and my little marching soldiers of immune boosting fantastic wonder are getting sent right where they need. Fever is the way that our body accomplishes it. So rather than suppressing it, I want to try and support it and manage it. Be cautious, okay, right now. The, the entity that stands to gain most from all of this fear and panic is government consolidation of power. When the herd gets scared, they want to run into their pens. And they tend to be much more willing to sacrifice liberty and freedom for some veneer of temporary security. And that's not how we need to roll. You know, I don't need people you know, invading my life and telling me you know, to sacrifice more and more freedom and give up this, that, and the other for some veneer of security. That's, that's bull. Like I've seen that so much in my life, and I know y'all have too. Let us, be, let us be calm. Let us be resolute and you know, strong. Our bodies were created by a divine creator, in my opinion, uh, and they were, function, they, were, they were set and designed to function in times like this. People say, oh, this is a new virus. We've never seen that before. Bull. Bull. The human experience is one of constant exposure and change. When you look at a, a baby or an infant or a toddler, they are coming into contact. Their little body is coming into contact for years with new invaders and new viruses that it's never seen before. And you know what happens? It acclimates, it adapts. That is the story of human history when it comes to exposure to different viruses, bacteria, you name it. We were designed to be able to withstand this if given the appropriate supportive mechanisms, right? Keep people hydrated with good quality water. Make sure and get enough rest. Make sure that your homes are clean. Make sure that you're practicing hand washing. Limit the amount of exposure to other people's germs and definitely other people's spit and body fluids when possible. Well, just be calm about it, okay? Just be calm, be rational. You got this, all right? I hope it was helpful for y'all. If you enjoyed the video, I hope you'll subscribe to me here on YouTube. You can also stay with me on Patreon and support me on uh, Subscribestar as well as Cryptocurrency. I got links down below. And like I said, I'll try and throw some links down in the description box to other helpful things. I hope it was helpful for y'all. Stay safe and be healthy. For now, it's Patreon signing off. I'll see y'all later.